Man, thanks for that. Turn tonight to Psalm 27. Psalm 27. I like to do a psalm a month, whether we need it or not, but I hadn't for the last couple months because we were in our Jude study. And so let's go to Psalm 27. As I bring a short message, notice the prayer from Joseph tonight. Uh, thank you for a short message, Father. <laughs> uh, he just knows what we do on Wednesday nights. Psalm 27. A psalm of David. The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the strength of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? I like that. We'll start right off with the rhetorical questions. There shouldn't be any fear in the children of God. When the Lord is your Lord, he's your light, he's your strength. Who shall you fear? Who should you be afraid? You know, it's what funny when kids are, are scared, you know what they want. Well, they might want mom or they want, might want dad, but they might want to sleep with the light on, right? Something about a little bit of light helps drive away all fear. Light inspires, light illuminates Light guides, thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. He is my salvation. He saved me from eternal spiritual death. He is my strength, the source of my ability to live my life. And with Jesus as your Savior, you never have to be without light. With Jesus as your Savior, you never have to be without strength. And if you've got light in this life, and if you've got strength in this life, well, you've got a lot. That's more than a lot of people can say. Because people are trying to find other sources of light, and they find out that they just don't quite shine enough. They're trying to find other sources of strength, and they find out that they fail. When we let something else guide our path, when we let something else uh, be our strength, we can falter. When we forget the importance of his salvation, we forget where we came from, we lose track of our spiritual priorities. When someone else is our strength, people make friends their strength. They make their spouse, I mean, I love my spouse, but she's not my strength. There's sometimes she's strong for me, and I'm thankful for her for that. But the Lord has to be your strength. But if we make something else, friends, family, self, we can find ourselves starting to make wrong decisions. We can find ourselves losing our joy. We can find ourselves given over to certain kinds of life's fears. Verse 2. When the wicked, even mine enemies and my foes, came upon me to eat up my flesh, they stumbled and fell. Though an host should encamp against me, my heart shall not fear. Though war should rise against me, and this will I be confident. That's something that the Lord can give you that you maybe you didn't have before. Real confidence. Confidence in something true and eternal. Not just self-boasting, not self-confidence. Confidence in Him. Now, he talks about how God can deliver him from his enemies. Even if there was a host round about him, he wouldn't be afraid. Now, here's the thing. God can protect us from enemies. And there are probably are times where we don't even know, but he was doing it. But I start to think about this and I start to think about circumstances in life. And God can actually change my circumstances and make them more favorable for me. He can do that. But if he doesn't, there's still no need to be afraid because he knows what he's doing. He understands everything that's going on. And he can fill my heart with faith to be an overcomer in tough circumstances. Because really... He's not looking so much to change our circumstances. He's looking for a change in us as we grow in faith. Verse 4, One thing have I desired of the Lord, that will I seek after, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, to behold the beauty of the Lord and to inquire in His temple. Now I understand this is Old Testament. They actually have... A, you know, an Old Testament tabernacle. And David in his heart wants to build a fixed temple to the Lord. He doesn't get to do it. Solomon, his son, does it. But they had, uh, you know, the idea of meeting was not new to them. And he had a great desire for God's presence. And uh, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord. To be in God's family, God's house, God's presence. Uh, not many people know this verse, believe it or not. Psalm 27, 4. You say, how do you know that, Pastor? Well, have you seen church attendance? 
<laughs> Just kidding. But uh, the idea here is if you could boil your primary life desire down to one thing, would this be it? It sounds like a rhetorical question to a Wednesday night praying crowd, but I think at times what should be our central desire gets overwhelmed with other less important desires, less important eternally, less important spiritually, but they seem important right now in the here and now to the flesh and to our schedules and to what we think we need. There will always be internal competition for our time and for our energies, that battle against the great central desire for God. Uh, someone might answer, well, you know, what's your greatest desire? Well, to raise a happy family, to make my wife happy, to see my kids succeed, to prepare a retirement fund. And, and none of those things are bad desires unless they're more important to you than this right here. If they're more important to you than the desire, verse 4, then your desires are out of order. And we need to make sure to make Jesus our first and foremost desire. God, a relationship with God. They aren't bad desires at all, but if they supersede this desire, then they, they can become heart idols if we're not careful. Verse 5. For in the time of trouble, he shall hide me in his pavilion. In the secret of his tabernacle shall he hide me. He shall set me upon a rock. And now shall mine head be lifted up above mine enemies round about me. Therefore will I offer in his tabernacle sacrifices of joy. Sacrifices of joy. I like that. When we think of sacrifices, we think of, you know, money, right? Or maybe time or maybe service or maybe prayer. And sometimes joy is a sacrifice because sometimes we're not really feeling joy. And we, joy is something that needs to be pursued spiritually. I will offer in his tabernacle sacrifices of joy. I will sing. Yea, I will sing praises unto the Lord. That's one way that will help you find joy. Hear, O Lord, when I cry with my voice. Have mercy also upon me and answer me. So now he's recognizing that God will protect him, that he can seek the Lord, that the Lord will listen, that the Lord will bring him through to the other side of his time of trouble you see in verse 5. A time of trouble. Everyone has a time of trouble. Sometimes we have times of trouble. Sometimes it's over in 10 minutes. Sometimes it takes years to get through your time of trouble. But God can bring us through to the other side. Amen. And so we come in faith and we offer sacrifices of joy and praise and in singing. And this is not a fake it until you make it. This is just understanding that if we will have some faith and apply these the truths, even when we don't feel like it, that God will get in it and bless it. I love verse 8. When thou saidst, seek ye my face, my heart said unto thee, thy face, Lord. Well, I seek. <laughs> so I think we can take uh, just the beginning of verse 8. When thou saidst, fill in the blank, I decided that's what I want. That's what I want to do. It's recognizing, I mean, it's, it's, uh, it's realizing God wants something specific from me because he wants his best for me. So I fill in the blank by searching God's word and I look at the will of God for my life. When thou saidst, Give sacrificially, I said, Lord, I'm going to give. When thou saidst, I want you to seek my face in prayer and Bible study, I said, I'm going to seek your face in prayer and Bible study. Just apply this to your life. It's so, so simple, right? When you said, trust Christ as your personal Savior, I said, I'm going to trust Christ. When you said, get baptized, I said, I'm going to get baptized. You said, go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature, I said, I'm going to get out there. And tell everyone I can the truth of the gospel. Amen. Confidence. Surrender. Verse 9. Hide not thy face far from me. Sometimes it feels like that. And that's why he prays this way sometimes. Put not thy servant away in anger. Thou hast been my help. Leave me not, neither forsake me, O God of my salvation. When my father and my mother forsake me, then the Lord will take me up. 
Sometimes we might feel forsaken, but we're never forsaken by the Lord if we've trusted his son, Jesus Christ. Jesus said, I will never leave thee nor forsake thee. It's almost like it's an answer to David's request in Psalm 27. But it's sometimes we feel that way. Sometimes we go through these emotional and spiritual struggle, struggles of feeling separated from God. Sometimes we're our own worst enemies. We get carnal. We mess around with sin. And, and you're going to definitely feel separate from God when you're living that way. And so the answer to that is more prayer and seeking his face and drawing closer to him. J James said, draw, draw nigh unto me and I will draw nigh unto you. Amen. Now, I like that. He said in verse 10, because your mother and your father, these are people, hopefully in this life, your parents are people that you love and trust. Hopefully that they've been that kind of parent for you. I know that's not true in every family. I know well, because parents are humans too. Parents are sinners too. Parents can fail too, right? But when you're a child, you certainly don't think that way. Even if they're horrible parents, before you know, really, before you, you know, come out of your innocence, you just always think mom and dad, they're always there for me, right? And so that's why he uses mom and dad in verse 10. If mom and dad even forsake me, I know where I can go. I have a heavenly father that will look after my every need. You're never alone when you're trusting Jesus Christ. Verse 11. Teach me thy way, O Lord. Sounds like a hymn we just sang. It's almost like I picked that on purpose tonight. Teach me thy way, O Lord, and lead me in a plain path because of mine enemies. Now, verse 11 is my kind of verse. <laughs> plain, simple. God, help me to understand my trials and your desires for, need, for me with plainness and simplicity. Sometimes you've got to just bring it all back to basics, people. The devil will try to confuse you and complicate things. If you want to go back to the simple heart of the matter, it really isn't all that complicated. Am I putting God first in this thing or not? Right? That's how we make things simple. And when I make this choice, is this just something that I want? Is this just something that I'm lusting after in my heart? Is this just because it gets me more money, more fame, more stuff, more whatever? Or is this really because I have a heart for God? Is this really what God wants for me? That's why I teach me thy way, O Lord, and lead me in a plain path. This idea of simplicity. A simple walk for the Lord. It doesn't have to be all that complicated. Sometimes churches feel like they're drying out, and so they start to add, add programs, add programs, add programs. We need to do something to generate some excitement around here. And I say, you know, I'm not against programs unless they're for the sake of, unless you're trying to, like drumming up excitement. I feel like people just need to get in touch with God in a simple way. And we need to encourage faithfulness and a plain faith and a plain walk with the Lord is a good way to walk. And it's basically the idea for me is, God, I'm not smart enough to figure it out. So please make it simple for me. Verse 12. Deliver me not over unto the will of mine enemies, for false witnesses are risen up against me, and such as breathe out cruelty. I had fainted unless I had believed to see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. Wait on the Lord, be of good courage, and he shall strengthen thine heart. Wait, I say, on the Lord. Well, he, now, verse 12 seems like a weird prayer, but you're not David. David was constantly running from his enemies. David had real, I mean, in the flesh enemies that wanted his life. And so this is a practical prayer for David. And he knew that there were cruel men out there that wanted him. And I don't know that we face that. Maybe on a different level. Maybe you have like a work enemy. I don't know. Maybe you have a family enemy that's always a thorn in your flesh. I don't know. Kids don't say anything. And so, no, I'm just saying. <laughs> and so, uh, you know, but maybe, you know, so maybe there's some way that you can apply that in your situation. It certainly won't be as extreme as David's. But he, so there's, but if it, if it can apply to you, like, I don't, I know, deliver me up. Like, there are times where people like want to pull your strings, hit your, hit your buttons, pull your buttons, press your buttons. I'm forgetting the colloquial word right now. They're trying to, they're trying to get a rise out of you. They just, they just like to throw something at you, throw spaghetti at the wall and see if it sticks. 
And you know what? You can say, God, don't let me get sucked into that stupid conversation again where I lose my cool, right? And so that's a way maybe you could apply that for prayer. Uh, at work, maybe there's someone that always just makes you lose your cool. You might have to prepare for that with more prayer about that specifically. Now he noticed verse 13, without God, I would have fainted. And that's a good thing to give God some glory. Like, I feel like I've been saved a long time. I know a lot of scripture. There are a lot of things I think that maybe weren't so simple for me 28 years ago that now are, are more simple for me. But I never want to take for granted that it's God's strength that's led me along and helped me to grow. And if, I, if it hadn't been for faith in the goodness of the Lord and his coming. So to me, when I, the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living, God cares about us in the here and now. God takes of our, our care of our needs in the here and now. Uh, seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things will be added unto you. Those are promises that the Christian can pray for, for sustenance in the land of the living, right? We also know Jesus is coming again. We'll see him in our flesh. And uh, we need some endurance. And that's where verse 14 comes in. He's basically saying, I know I'd fail without faith. Proverbs 24 says, if thou faint in the day of adversity, thy strength is small. The challenge in Proverbs is to have a deeper, more spiritual strength. So when the day of adversity comes, when verse 5, the time of trouble comes, we're not fainting. We're not messing up. And so we want increased strength. We want increased faith. We want this kind of spiritual endurance. That's why it's weighed on the Lord. Be of good courage. He shall strengthen thine heart. Wait, I say, on the Lord. He doubles it. And that reminds me of Isaiah 40. Isaiah 40, verse 28 says, Hast thou not known, hast thou not heard that the everlasting God, the Lord, the creator of the ends of the earth, fainteth not, neither is weary? Sometimes we get tired. God never gets tired. There is no searching of his understanding. He is way smarter than we'll ever be. He giveth power to the faint. And to them that have no might, he increases strength. When you're without strength, you just tell God about it. He might give you some extra strength just to show that he can. He loves to use the small and the meek and the weak things to confound the wise. Verse 30 of Isaiah 40 says, Even the youths shall faint and be weary, and the young men shall utterly fail, but... They that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings as eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. And so I think Isaiah 40 is a great coupling with Psalm 27, 14. These ideas to wait on the Lord. Now that doesn't mean to sit around, sit around, sit around and twiddle our thumbs. <laughs> <laughs> when you see wait, you think like a waiter. A waiter is someone that patiently stands by and serves and is, and is ready and watching for the needs of his master. And so, but this idea here being is like, I can't, there are a lot of things I can't make happen. And there are a lot of things that I just can't do in my own strength, even though we try sometimes when we butt our heads against the wall, Right? And it's time sometimes to just back off and say, God, I really like David, I really need you to intervene. And I'm asking for a plain path here, some simple understanding about what I'm supposed to do next and how I'm supposed to fulfill your will for my life. And and this and that all goes back to that great desire from verse four. And I'll close by reading verse four again. One thing have I desired of the Lord that will I seek after that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life to behold the beauty of the Lord and to inquire in his temple. And again, I know that's Old Testament. We're talking about a a beautiful uh, uh, temple there, but uh, the temple represents the presence of God. And so I want to say this, Christian, just don't quit on the Lord. Don't quit on the church. Desire in your heart to be part of God's presence and what he does. And you know he's present in the body of believers. What is God to you? He's light, he's salvation, and he's strength, and he's my desire. And you can find all these things all the way through. And then we have encouragement that if even if your mother and your father were to forsake you, God won't.
if you'll seek him and uh, just wait on him, have good courage and watch as he builds you and strengthens you despite your circumstances. You know, when you have a tough day coming up, really natural to say, God, can you take this from me? That's what Paul did three times. Lord, would you take this from me? And he said, my grace is sufficient for thee. And that's all I've got tonight. Amen.